Hey, hello florists and flower lovers. Welcome to the Boerman Institute. Today we have a very special live stream uh, for you. Uh, we have Susan McCleary. She is here at the school. She just taught a two-day masterclass on wearables. One day was focused on uh, headpieces and the other was on botanical tattoos and other cool stuff. So um, without further ado, I would like to introduce Susan McCleary to uh, the stage. So I hope you enjoy everyone and please if you have any questions uh, feel free to ask them. All right, have fun. Have fun too. <laughs> Thank you. Hello everybody. I'm so happy to be here uh, in Ausmere um, at the Borma School. I enjoyed my two-day master class very much. The students made beautiful works um, all the way from little tiny rings to large headpieces, everything in between. It was really a good time. So today I'm going to share with you two designs, um, kind of my favorite designs at the moment. Um, first, uh, asymmetrical floral fascinator or floral headpiece. And then second, a um, kind of statement piece um, made with just a few materials, um, purposely kind of light and minimal um, and uh, evocative of the in between season when things are starting to fade. So I'm using some um, kind of brambly branches from the garden as well as some really beautiful clematis uh, from Margan Parr. So first the headpiece. So I've done some of the work ahead of time um, because this is a little time consuming. However, it's worth it <laughs> and it only requires a few flowers. So I'm really attracted lately to kind of monobotanical work. I feel like it's refreshing and sophisticated. And I also like um, maybe those who aren't florists to be really curious about um, what the piece is made of. So I feel when you use one material and kind of use it in repetition, it, it almost becomes a textile or um, it might be uh, mistaken for ribbon or fabric or even feathers. So what I've done here is I've cut the blooms off of a really nice fluffy hybrid white delphinium and I've strung them on a very light uh, wire. And in, in mass here all together, they really take on a different character than they, they do when they're on the stem. So um, I think manipulating in this very simple way, but over and over, um, forms a really nice effect. So let me show you what I've done with these. I trim them from the stem, like I said, and then I just use a delicate gauge wire. This one is probably a 26 gauge, which would be what here? Um, I think you're having a zero point. Very delicate. Four. Yeah, zero yeah. Four I just make a little U with my plier. And then I cut them off the stem and I kind of grade them um, starting with the smallest and working up to larger blooms so I can have a nice uniform tassel. And a tassel that feels like it has a little termination point. So I'm looking for a tiny guy. Here's a nice one. So I start with the smallest and then I pierce up the center as best I can and pull it down on that that little hook. The first one is secured and then I can keep threading. So I've done that a number of times, making tassels that will kind of cascade down one side of the fascinator. And then for a few of them, um, I've strung the blooms in order of size and then midway through, I changed direction and strung again so that I have two um, kind of lengths of this tassel that I can attach so the front and back of the headpiece will look finished in a quick manner. So maybe I'll do that really quickly for you. And I do love questions. It makes um, these classes so much more fun and rich. So if you have any questions, even not related to what I'm doing, I'm happy to try to answer.
I love to use um, delphinium because it, even though it looks delicate and papery, it's very uh, sturdy. It lasts a long time. You can make a piece like this three days ahead, four days ahead of an event, spray it with water, cover it with a light paper, paper towel, or even reused um, packing paper, and then pop it in an airtight container so it can keep that humidity. And then from there, uh, ideally tuck it into a flower cooler or the coolest space you have access to. So here about halfway, I'll change direction. So the blooms are facing the opposite direction now and I'll continue to, to uh, thread to finish off this tassel. Question. Yes. Not a question yet, but uh, not a question yet. But we have uh, Henny Decker saying hello and good luck. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and we have flowers are wonderful saying hello from Swans Island, Maine, USA. Oh, wonderful, Maine. Haven't been there in several years, but it's a beautiful state, full of waterfalls. It's a gorgeous state. Okay. So I'm just uh, choosing smaller blooms now to work my way up, um, finishing that little, that little tassel. And when I feel finished, I just trim the wire a bit, leaving myself enough of a, a little end there that I can make another U and hook that end bloom in, in place. So I just bend and make another U shape with my wire and then that bloom is locked in place as well. So when we get to the headpiece base, in between here, these two tassels, that's where I'll attach and I'll kind of have a nice finished front and back. Okay, so let's work on the headpiece base now. There's so many ways to make headpiece bases, but this is one of my favorites, probably because um, it's comfortable uh, approachable. Um, some of the mechanics are already made for you. So what I do is uh, use a metal headband. Getting ahead of myself now. Metal headband like this. And then I want to create some volume. I want to have something light and wearable um, inside. Uh, creating a a pillow for my flowers to be attached to. So uh, I have a little bit of chicken wire that I've rolled into this kind of crescent shape. And then I'm using this Cecil covered wire and I'll cover my chicken wire with that. I chose this one because it matches my hair color. <laughs> okay. okay, so starting at one end, I'll kind of attach the wire just by pinching it simply around the wire uh, frame and then I wrap it. This armature I feel could be applicable to a lot of different um, designs actually. Large rolls of chicken wire could be used um, as a base mechanic for instance. And we have a question. Not a question yet, but Marion Harding is saying hello from the UK. Love the intricacy and botanical feel. Great. Hello. Thank you. So I'm just simply wrapping. <clears throat> so the chicken wire um, I love for a lot of reasons. It's affordable. It's easy to access for most people. Um, like I said, it creates volume, so you're starting with something a little bit larger than just starting with the flowers themselves. And it has lots of little nooks and crannies where you can um, hang wired tassels or glue materials into. Or if you find a nice little um, nook that feels really secure, you can just insert some stems as well. So a lot of um, potential here. So just wrapping. This is a material we don't have at home. 
and that's probably because, or probably be why I like it, <laughs> because we don't have it. Two people here, it might just be a, an old kind of shelf sitter that never gets used, but I think it has um, some personality. I like it. I like how it looks like hair. Okay, now I trim and I just tuck in that end, make sure it's secure, just weaving it back into the wire. And then I attach this to my headband. Okay. I like this shape. This is a shape I use often. <laughs> I think it um, is flattering on most people. It's not too much. Um, it can feel wearable um, for a wedding, for a photo shoot, certainly, for a special event, a floral show maybe. So I'll attach it to the headband now in two places so that it feels secure. And the flowers I'm using are pretty light, so I'm not terribly worried about this shifting, but I do want to at least attach it in two spots so that it doesn't slide or move around during wear. Question? Yes. A uh, question from Flowers Are Wonderful. Where do you get the seesaw wrap wire in the U.S.? That's a good question. <laughs> I've never seen it. But you could use uh, rustic wire. Um, it's very similar. The gauge of the wire um, inside the seesaw feels like the same gauge as the Oasis rustic wire to me. I just like that it has this little added texture and a little bit more hair um, kind of quality. Okay, so there we are. Now we place it on the head form. Question? Well, uh, I must say that if you really, really, really want a seesaw oh, wire, right. <laughs> um, we do sell it online in our uh, shop. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think Axel once told me we do ship worldwide. So. That is true. And we have it yes. in different colors. How silly of me. Of course. Visit the website. Oh, yeah. The website is uh, floraldesignsupplies.com yes, or, or NL. <laughs> okay, so now the low side, I'll add some of my tassels and just um, leaving myself a little wire to be able to weave into that chicken wire form. I just simply take it around and secure it. In the empty spaces, I'll be using floral glue to attach more of the Del delvinium florets. So don't worry that the tassels don't cover the armature completely. And I'll just kind of work my way up in this way, finding a little nook to feed my wire through, and then just simply twisting it around itself to attach. I like to have a little bit of motion, especially for a runway setting um, when the person moves and walks. The piece has uh, some movement, which is quite nice. But the fine gauge wire also gives me some control. I can kind of round out the shape and create a nice kind of gathering of my tassels. So sometimes people say, florists, say that wearables are not the most practical um, activity that one could practice, but I think that um, there's two things that I try to do with floristry. The first is I try to surprise the public and make them more curious about what we do as florists. And I think that that is a way to elevate floristry in their minds, in the culture's mind. Um, and wearables are a way that we can really 
um, grab their attention and surprise them and show them we're capable of some really interesting work, um, even if we're not going to sell it to them necessarily. So that's the first reason why I love wearables, that I can surprise people with them. And the second, um, I think that we deserve to give ourselves some time to be creative and um, really express the ideas that we get in our heads. And wearables are a wonderful way for florists to take just a few stems of flowers and make something really interesting just for our own artistic expression. So the ones that I made that are two-sided, I'm using that space in between the two tassels and I place that on the headpiece form and then use a little U-shaped wire length to attach. So I'll just scoop a little bit of that armature with my U-shaped wire and then attach the two tassels. If I can see, it's getting harder to see with my my eyes. <laughs> I can do it. It's going to take a few attempts here. Okay, there we are. And then bring the two ends together and then simply twist a few times and it's attached to the to the headpiece form. So just made made like a rounded C-shaped U with the wire. Scoop a little piece of that armature. There we have it. Place the tassel and secure. This kind of reminds me of um, wisteria a little bit. I can style the bangs to the side if I want. Maybe one like this. Like that. And then the gaps I can fill in with my individual florets and just a touch of floral glue. This one that you can also get at the Borma shop <laughs> is wonderful and I've never used it before. Um, it's called Tecar Flor. It's an Italian floral glue and it works very well. And it's also clear. Okay, just grabbing a little in that chicken wire form and then laying my tassel and securing. So with a little more time um, I could fill the whole armature without having to use floral glue at all so keep that in mind if you'd prefer not to use it. I think I'll go back here with the final tassel. So delphinium's a favorite. I love working with hyacinth. I love uh, agapanthus for wearables. Um, I love uh, multi-bloom stems of flowers because I can manipulate them this way uh, and make expressive things but that are also very simple and I hope feel kind of refreshing and, and sophisticated. Maybe I'll just finish the front um, very quickly with some blooms. This uh, glue, like the Oasis Clear um, formula, does need to get a little bit dry before it wants to grab hold. So assembly line work is um, recommended. So you just place a little glue <laughs> on the bloom and let it get tacky. 
And once it's tacky, you can make fast work of attaching it to the headpiece. Doesn't take long, maybe 15 seconds, 20 seconds. So this piece will dry. Um, the delphinium will shrink a bit, of course, and get a little crinkly and maybe get darker in color. But you could potentially keep a piece like this um, until the flowers start to get too dry and brittle to wear. But that's also fun to think about creating headpieces that can dry and last longer than the length of an event. Okay, just a few more and then we'll start adding our first row. Always helps to keep the glue in a little cup there and I also put my cap in the cup so the cap doesn't roll away or get stuck to the back of my hand or something. Okay, so the first one is ready to go. These guys are trying to jump in on the party right now. Okay, we'll start here. And just kind of working my way up the piece. The little hairs on the um, Cecil, mm -hmm. yes. the Cecil covered wire um, are perfect for gluing because they're just ready to grab a, a hold of the glue they like it. Anything fuzzy, anything that has some texture to it is a great surface for gluing. Just kind of lifting up the bangs, finding little spots that need to be covered. The strings are fun. <laughs> glue is such a good tool. Um, people sometimes get frustrated working with it, but once you make friends with it, you're friends for life, I think. Okay, so ideally I would like to spin the piece around and finish these little gaps here but um, I think for the purpose of today, that's a good coverage. Yes, question? Yes, question from Berardi Hair and Makeup. Is yes. it a special glue for flowers? It is, yes indeed. Um, these types of glues are called um, floral adhesives or cold glue because they are in fact um, not heated up like a glue, a glue gun um, and they're more protective for the flowers. They don't damage them with heat. So yeah, ideal, ideal for flowers. Yeah, okay. Should I try it on? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. It's very helpful to have a head form too um, so that you can see more or less what it will look like on a person. Very helpful. And the waterproof tape holds it on the head form nicely. Okay, let's go in here. There we go. I need to move so I can see. Okay. Yeah, so just style the bangs how you like, to the side. <laughs> of course, it's opposite, so I'm using the wrong hand. There we go. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so wearable, light, fun. Great for a photo shoot, maybe for an experimental bride one that is ready to have a little bit of a fashion moment. Yeah. Yeah. So cute. Sure. All right. Any questions on that before I move on to the next idea? I think then a little bit of time because of the delay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Would you like some water? I have some tea. I'll have a sip of tea in a moment. Okay, so we can revisit this guy later if, if needed. Yeah, question. Yes, Chad Thomas. What? Says, how long will it last? <laughs> Hello, Chad Thomas. 
Um, so these pieces are made to last the length of an event. Um, so in my mind, that's about 10 hours. The delphinium is such a nice, strong, papery flower that it will last longer. In fact, I made a piece, um, gosh, three days ago now, and it's been out of water, um, or I'm sorry, out of the cooler, uh, in and out, back and forth, on models, back in the cooler uh, for three days now. And it looks, I think, as fresh as the day it was made. So um, it depends on what flowers you use, but ideally the length of the event is my goal. Mm -hmm. We have Susanna Ferreira, a florist and wedding coach, saying, amazing, I love this creation. Oh, thank you. And Bernardi <laughs> Hair and Makeup says, are you guys going to leave all the material you, uh, you use in the description for later? Sure, yes. Yeah. Yes, we can do that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, a piece like this could also be a shoulder piece, which is really fun. So for a photo shoot, these kinds of um, uh, little wearable artworks, I like to try them on a number of ways and kind of maximize their use um, and have as much fun as possible with them. So just another little idea. All right. So next, yes, another question. Flowers are wonderful, says, I feel the same as you about creating such unusual headpieces, even though I am a florist. Um, kissing emoji, we, I, I love working with them. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, so that's one of my favorite wearables to make. Um, simple, doesn't require a lot of uh, stems something you can do pretty quickly. Um, I think that the stringing took me, I, I timed one of them, it took me three minutes to string one of those and I made about 10 tassels total. So you saw how easy it was to assemble. Um, the prep time was also pretty quick and pretty easy as well. So next, one of my other favorite things to do, um, centerpieces. And uh, just like the headpiece, uh, lately I'm attracted to more minimal works using less flowers and really kind of um, focusing on the qualities of the things I've selected and trying to really show them off. So I'll make kind of a statement piece that you might um, place in an entrance for an event um, in your home. Um, it's a great piece for, for classes if you're a florist um, or for Instagram to um, show just uh, the, the best of the season. Um, to show off the, the graceful curves of materials and just focus kind of on a few items and the lines and qualities of each. So maybe I clear a little bit and then I bring on my materials for that. In the meantime, I have a question uh, mm -hmm. about the previous uh, the headpiece sure. uh, from Berardi Hair and Makeup. Mm -hmm. um, if you would put in the shoulder, how would you place it to be secure? Mm -hmm. So uh, the headpiece that I showed you that I suggested you could place on the shoulder is made on um, a faux leather platform. So I cut kind of a, a crescent shape out of faux leather fabric or upholstery fabric or really any kind of stiff waterproof fabric. Um, and then I supplement that fabric with wire. So I'll cut my crescent, I'll cut two equal um, size templates and then glue a little bit of wire um, onto one of the pieces of fabric, sandwich the other on top, and then I have a nice um, reliable uh, fabric template that has this little wire backbone inside. I add my flowers to that and then the piece can be attached with corsage magnets. Um, one magnet placed on top underneath the, fl the flowers and the back um, of course, on the back of the platform, or um, I really like to use kinesiology tape, um, and I glue a strip of kinesi kinesiology tape underneath the fabric platform. When it's time to wear, the paper backing of the tape is removed, and then it can be placed um, on the body. Yeah, so a few ways you can do that. If the person's wearing um, clothing and you don't want, want to use tape on the clothing, you can also use corsage pins to attach 
a piece like this onto a garment. Yeah, I hope that helps. <laughs> okay. Yep. So inside this nice bowl, um, I have a pin frog this size. It's probably three inches in diameter, I think, pin frog. That will help me um, to hold some of my upright materials, some of my heavier materials or taller materials. And then I'm going to supplement that frog with a natural armature, just a very easy to make, um, not fussy, just any kind of vine will do natural armature and I'll show you how to do that. So this bit, this is when I wrestle with my vines and this doesn't have to be perfect. I get a little bit of vine wire prepared. So I have some ivy here and then another vine that I found in the um, mountain of goodies outside the Borma school. <laughs> and what I do is I just hold the stems of the vine in my hand and bring the loops back into my hand. I'm trying to create kind of a chicken wire alternative, um, a medium that I can use to support my flower insertions. So I'll just keep adding to this, making loops. This doesn't have to be beautiful. It just needs to give me lots of little nooks and crannies where I can secure my stems. And it needs to, for me, for this purpose, disappear inside of my vessel. So I don't want to make it taller or you know necessarily that much wider than my vessel so I just I keep kind of winding around I've never worked with this vine it's a little bit snappy but it's giving me some loop and I kind of manipulate them in my hand to make them twist this way and that the ivy, I know, will be a helpful twister because it's nice and flexible. Just keep going until I have a nice mass. This is a very, very simple technique. You can see that it's not beautiful, it's not precise. It's just about the size that I'm after and kind of the volume. A smaller armature could be used to support a spiral bouquet, especially if you, especially if you have um, heavy items that you want to add to the bouquet or very um, kind of pendulous materials like Phalaenopsis orchids, for instance, need some sort of support in a bouquet. A little miniature of this idea can be used and um, really support things like that, that need some security. And of course, you can go larger with this and use this on a very large base to support materials. Okay, we're getting there. For an event, these could be made ahead of time, of course. And at some um, floral wholesalers, you can even find like spheres of willow already made, and they're usually quite affordable. That can be used as well. So I have kind of a nice little arrangement here, I think. I'll bind it with bind wire and then we'll tuck it in the vase. Okay. 
Okay, here we are. <laughs> and we shove it in. This part is not so elegant. But I like that I have to force it in because that means once it's in, it won't pop out and it will give me a lot of um, support for my materials. It's okay if a few little loops are showing. I'll cover that with my flowers. And this feels nice and secure. Oh my, this is great. <laughs> Okay, <sighs> wonderful. All right, so I have some beautiful cultivated flowers and then I have some uh, lovely materials from the garden. And I think I'll start with my asparagus. I typically start with the tallest materials um, and this is just amazing. It's so vibrant, but it's natural. It hasn't been painted. I think this is asparagus fern. Yeah, yeah. From the yeah it's from the garden. <laughs> I know. Yeah, so I wanted to work with white and yellow. Um, and we went for a little walk in the, in the garden to get some ginkgo leaves. And then I just happened to see this asparagus. And this for me is like amazing. The color is just incredible. Um, unexpected and really like evocative of the fall when things kind of are just about to uh, fade. So I'm finding a little space in the armature, guiding the branch down and then securing, securing it into the pin frog. And I think what I'd like to do, I'm going way over my, my ceiling limit, aren't I? <laughs> I can go a little shorter. Let's try. Let's try to behave. Okay. Okay, guiding it in through the armature and then into the pin frog. It really is such a electric yellow. It's amazing. Ah, there's a question. Yes. Yes, Susan Faraday <laughs> says, uh, or is asking, is it really natural? Like, is it natural? Yeah. And also, I need to take more walks in the garden. <laughs> I did not know this color existed. Yeah. It was under um, a larger tree, and I think maybe it just didn't see a lot of sunlight. Yeah, so. It really turned yellow. Due to all the stress. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think I want this to be a little bit more upright. I want to have a high side, a slightly lower side here, and then a side that kind of spills forward. So just looking to see what pieces would like to go in what area based on their form. And then I'd like to keep this center a little bit open for the moment because I'd like a focal area to kind of spill over to the left of center and I don't want to fill this negative space up too much. So for me the frogs I don't use them typically for centerpiece work for events because often the flowers go home with the client at the end of the night and the frogs are a little too precious to go home um, at the end of every event. You could certainly bill that into the price of the flowers, but it's not always the most practical. So the frogs for me are used for statement pieces, um, definitely for pieces that I design um, 
in homes or in my own home for demonstration pieces. And anytime I want to create a really upright positioning and I want to be very precise with that, Frog is a great tool for that. Okay, next, um, my ginkgo. And this I made, actually. I uh, didn't want to cut the Borma's ginkgo branches. <laughs> so when we went for a walk in the garden, we found plenty of fallen ginkgo leaves and then little delicate branches from another plant that I have not identified yet. Um, I just took a little bit of floral glue and then attached the leaves to these delicate branches. And then I have whatever shape and um, size, length, ginkgo branch that I want. So I'll add this one to my high side and I love how the rounded form brings the eye up. Actually, do I want to do this? And this one to the opposite side. Okay. And then my third, kind of cascading forward with the asparagus that I've placed here. So I often choose three kind of floral pockets, if you will, to focus on. I have one here on the left, my tallest um, concentration of materials, a slightly shorter concentration on the right, and then a third that kind of spills forward. Okay, so next. We're going to work with these nearing that are amazing. I do these next because I want to keep them tall because they really are so expressive. So I'd like to make sure that I choose good spots for these before moving on. Yes, these are from Margin Par. Yeah. I love the curly stems. And nearing, I think, is a flower that deserves more attention. It's wonderful for corsage work, for wearable work. It's very long lasting. Um, and it's just such an interesting, um, long, strong stem. So let's place these fun ones first. I think this one wants to go over here. I think I'll find a spot in the frog for this to land. And maybe a partner a little higher. This one kind of echoes the um, curve of the taller side of the piece, so I'll place that here. This is also a wonderful shape. I'm getting closer and closer to the ceiling here. 
but I can't help it because the stems are so long, I don't want to cut them. Okay, I've kind of attached myself here. There we are. Oh, there's a question. Like, who's... Yes. Who's over there? It's me. It's you. Yes. Yes. So, Susana Pereira says, in my country, Portugal, I don't have this type of tree. It is really beautiful, the leaves. It is. It is. Ginkgo is wonderful. So, my third area of concentration here, I'll float a few of those nearing in that area. Actually, uh, those ginkgo trees are not native to the Netherlands either. So mm. um, we just got them from Japan. Oh, did you? Yeah. yeah. We have them growing in Michigan too, but yes, they're also not native, I imagine. They're a slow growing tree as well. Another reason why I didn't want to cut the branch. I'd rather create my own branches, especially um, with a slow growing material. I think I'd like this a little shorter to step down from the partner flower over here. Oh boy, here we are. Maybe not. Maybe not. Question? Not a question, but we have Edras Rook. Mm -hmm. saying hello from Washington, D.C. You guys oh, wow. always surprise me. <laughs> In a good way? I hope. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. Okay, so next I have beautiful mustard-colored flowers from uh, roses, from Deco Roses. This is a new variety. I don't think it's been released or named yet. Um, but a very of-the-moment color, I believe, that will be popular for a long time. I think I'll place these kind of low in this area here so they can be seen. And continue to open as the piece is enjoyed. Question? Um, first of all, we have Edras Rook saying yes to uh, that it is a good thing that, uh, that we uh, surprise, uh, we always surprise. <laughs> um, and we have Evil Crack 4921 saying, oh. I actually saw ginkgo trees in Portugal in Fatima. Oh. Uh, you just need to find a good forest. That's true. two together here, kind of forming one little focal area, starting to create a focal area there. And then the other two, I think one will go higher in this high side of the piece. And the other will go over here. Barardi Hair and Makeup says, what an amazing combination of flowers. Hmm. Thank you. I didn't want to go too heavy. I want to keep it pretty simple. I'd like a little more separation here. <laughs> we'll work on that. Okay, and then the star of the show, the Clematis. Now, anytime I see these, I have to have them. Um, one of my very favorite flowers and such a long lasting, reliable flower, even though it is so delicate looking and it's beautiful from the back as well. Just gorgeous. And these are for a margin bar as well. Yeah. 
So I decided to cut um, the foliage off of the clematis because I wanted to focus on the uh, mustard yellow kind of fall vibes. So I just trimmed out the green, just simply trimmed the leaves off so they wouldn't take away too much from the other colors that I've gathered. Question? Yes, a question from Margaret Bussman. Mm -hmm. Is uh, your schedule for uh, 2023 already uh, known for the, the lessons and uh, Ah, thank you for Is that question. <laughs> um, well, I teach online. That's my primary focus. I have um, a membership, the virtual studio, um, with new classes every month. And I think there's a library of over... I know there's a library. I think there's over about 80 lessons in there at the moment, maybe even more. Um, so that's always a place where you can find me. And then next year, what am I doing? I don't know. <laughs> come again, come again. Yeah, I might come again. Um, I'm supposed to go to Seoul. I'm supposed to teach in Seoul. Um, what else am I doing next year? Yeah, I have to have my calendar in front of me. But if you um, visit my um, website, my name, susanmcclary.com, there's links to everything um, as events are added. They're, they're refreshed and, and put in the calendar there. I'd like to turn this around for a moment so I can see what is happening. And I like to make edits throughout so that I don't get too far away from the um, shape that I intended. Question? Yes, a quick question from yes. the Lardy Hair and Makeup. Mm -hmm. The asparagus flower plant, is, mm -hmm. is, is it the one we eat and uh, get from the stores? I believe so. Yeah, it's just been allowed to continue to grow, and then it sets seed, and then this is the final expression of the plant before it goes to bed for the winter. <laughs> okay, I am missing one item that I would like to add before the clematis. And that is the Crocosmia. And I actually have a mystery ingredient here that may get worked in as well. Having access to a little garden, it doesn't matter how large, but there's always something really interesting, especially this time of year. I think this is a meadow rue that's gone to seed and then has dried in this very kind of curled uh, fashion and it it really uh, speaks to the vessel. The vessel has these little um, metal kind of like um, what would you call that? Little like hammered details, little specks. And then this has the same coloration and again the little specks. So for me, this really kind of speaks to the container. Yes, question. Uh, we have Margaret Bussman saying, what a beautiful combination. Normally, I don't like yellow, but this is really beautiful. I love yellow. <laughs> that was my intention, and we talked about that, that a lot of people um, are not attracted to yellow. And I don't know what happened to me, but um, I was one of those people, and orange as well. And all of a sudden, I just i am only attracted to yellow and orange. So um, maybe when you give things a chance... Um, and maybe when you choose materials that are unexpected, the color of the rose is very unexpected. The color of the asparagus is unexpected. The crocosmia, when it, when it starts to fade for the fall, turns this kind of bronze, calmer orange that's really pleasant. So maybe that has something to do with it. Okay, so I'll add some of these in. I think I'm, I'm excited to... I see myself on a screen and I see these fine folks and then I hear, I know there's people watching, so I feel a little like, whoo. Nice, yeah, it is very nice, um, but it's making me forget what, I, what ingredients I have. Mm -hmm. So these next, the Crocosmia. And since I've already set the line with my first few materials, I can just very um, comfortably add the rest of my ingredients just following the line that I set first. Yes, question. We have Hazel Colley saying hello from Hazel in Neuss, Germany. 
Ah, hello, Hazel. I love that name. And a question from mm -hmm. me. Where would the perfect spot be to put this arrangement? I think um, on a pedestal, in an entryway, um, to an event, um, in a restaurant, at a bar, somewhere kind of narrow but tall. Um, we have not the largest house, but we have really tall ceilings. So I always think about filling, filling that space. How do I fill that space? Uh, so settings, like event settings, often have really tall ceilings, but not a lot of um, landscape to, you know, to work with. So if you go tall, you can fill a space nicely. And with not a lot of materials, you don't need a lot of dense flowers to fill a tall space. Especially if you make your own branches. <laughs> I'm just kind of feeding these in until I'm happy with the density. Question? Oh. Nope. nope. I like the question stick. <laughs> the question stick has this very gentle rattle. Yeah, a little crunch. Okay, and then I'll add some to that third area coming towards the eye. The asparagus is nice because it it's allowed me to set my shape, but it also is this kind of gauzy veil, like a vine, um, like what a vine would offer. Um, for me, vines are often the finishing a bit of an arrangement that kind of accentuate uh, dynamic lines or soften areas or kind of fill in negative space. Um, but it's so wispy and light, it's kind of doing two duties. It's setting my shape, but also kind of adding that finishing fine veil layer to the piece. I want more things to kind of float down and, and marry the piece to the vase. We'll get there. Question? Not a question, but this is very cute. Margaret Bosman says, I would immediately bring this piece to my daughter. Um, I became a grandma uh, la yesterday Aww. from my first grandchild. Oh, congratulations. And it's a little baby boy. So uh, beautiful. Oh, that's the best. Congratulations, Margaret. <laughs> Yep, question? Yes, from Berardi Hair and Makeup. Does your subscription allow you to see the educational videos of your work? Yes, in fact, yes. So I started the virtual studio, oh gosh, maybe 2017. And every month since, I've been adding a new um, tutorial to the library. Um, and so when you join, it doesn't matter when you join, you have access to all of those tutorials and all of the upcoming ones as long as you are a member. And we do a lot of different topics, um, a lot of wearables, um, uh, centerpiece work, uh, bouquet work, large scale installation work, and all with sustainable mechanics, especially for the larger pieces. Some of the wearable pieces, I do use glue and wire and so on, um, but I try to focus on sustainable or reusable mechanics for my large scale pieces. 
Yeah, question. Jennifer Thompson says, we have a ginkgo in our here Fortshire garden. Did oh. you know that it is the oldest tree known to man and wow. used in Chinese medicine? Wow. Well, I did know about, yeah, the health benefits of ginkgo. You can eat the nuts. Yeah, the nuts are beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's true. Okay, I will add this, but it's so delicate and, and fine. I'm going to add it last. So now I go to my clematis. Yes, question. Yes, question from Susanna Ferreira. Which do you prefer to make, hair or body accessories, or this type of arrangement? Mm. It depends on my mood, I think. Um, I think I'm most comfortable making wearables. That's where I got my start. Um, before I was a florist, I was uh, making jewelry as my creative expression. So um, right away, I was attracted to the fine, detailed handiwork. So I think that's probably my favorite um, part of floristry. But I also like very large scale. Um, yeah, it depends. It depends on what's inspiring me at the moment. These have so many little laterals that are really beautiful, actually, little tendrils where I've cut the foliage off. And they like to hang on to each other. So I'm going to separate them so I can grab them more easily. All right, so I have created a little support for two of the clematis so that I can use them up high. So I just took um, some sticks from outside and water tubes and a little bit of bind wire in two spots so the tube stays nice and secure. And I'll place those in the high portion of the piece and then I can float some clematis up high. I have to make sure to tuck them in somewhere where the tubes can be hidden. And they may be hidden by other clematis later as well. Maybe that hides behind that rose there. We'll give that a whirl. And we have the water tube filler. How thirsty are clematis, do you think, Mike? Pretty thirsty. Pretty thirsty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But for an event, the um, amount in the water tube would be enough. Yeah, you can always check on them, uh, uh, but it should, it should be enough, yeah, for yeah. an evening. For an evening. So I'm using those little arms that the leaves were once attached to, to kind of grab hold of the crocosmia so that the clematis stays where I want it. Oh, so okay. At the beginning of the, an event, you might want to refresh them more often. I see. If it's a couple of days, then eventually you don't have to water them too much. Okay, so they need one big long drink, yeah. and then later they don't need as much. Or did I get that wrong? Well, and it might be just true for all flowers, but I, I just found that uh, when we were doing an event, uh, I had to refresh the water so often. Mm -hmm. um, and then later on in the event, I would have to have less and less refills, and this was on an event of a couple of days. Ah, nice. So I love uh, hmm, any flower that has uh, two colors in, in it, and this is a subtle expression of that, but this, this yellow next to the white really becomes special when it's placed next to other yellow things. The yellow center for me just becomes part of the composition in such a wonderful way. Um, a, re a rep repetition of that color, and also the little hairs of the center speak to the little hairs of the asparagus. Little things like that make me so happy. And that's why I am a flower nerd. <laughs> they give me moments of joy, these simple little details. 
So for a real event, I would definitely place these on site because this won't ride in the van very well in the little water tube just bobbing along like that. But the other flowers I could certainly um, arrange ahead of time. And I really like how floppy they are. Um, often um, flowers that you get uh, as a florist are really uniform and, and really static. And so any flower that has some natural movement, some bounce, I think is really uh, attractive. Really feels um, natural and romantic. Really can't see what I'm doing here. Ay yeah yeah. Okay, editing. <laughs> So just kind of peppering these in, working my way up this, this side that's slightly lower than the other side. And then I'll add several to the focal area, the primary focal area that's spilling forward of the base. you in the back of course you don't want the back to be completely devoid let's go in this area now question yes question from Inika's fashion what is the mm -hmm. name of the white flower? This one here is the clematis from Margan Parr. Beautiful. I grow these in my garden, but uh, they're never this beautiful. <laughs> they're much smaller, uh, typically, when you grow them yourself on the vine. And the stems are not as reliable. These stems are very strong. So I'm going to tuck a few into that focal area behind the, the ones that I just placed so I can really reinforce that, that area so that it becomes a nice firm spot for the eye to land. to rein in my asparagus a bit. And any little edits. So just like fixing your hair, if a curl is going in the wrong direction, you can always kind of make it go in the right direction to uh, you know, make sure you have the overall composition that you were hoping. Um, so I'm just kind of taking these, these little tendrils and kind of teasing them back where I wanted them so that this one is kind of swirling up, bringing the eye up, and this one's kind of repeating but a little bit higher than the other. Still have this kind of empty space in the center, some deliberate um, resting blank space.
I want this to be a little higher, I think. You can use those arms to grab it, make it do what I'd like. This I can make cascade a little bit lower. Okay. And now what I believe is meadow rue. I can edit and use little pieces and really kind of tease out the shape that I want. Guide it through. so light. I just need to find a little nook for it to secure and then it's really set in place. Question? Yes. Jane from Vermont, USA is asking, I assume you would need to create this on site. Transport Transportation would be tricky. Well, I've definitely um made things like this ahead of time maybe not with such delicate garden materials i mean i have some really light um, flexible uh, materials but if i was using stronger uh, foliage then yes i could make this ahead of time and then it's just a matter of having a transportation system that keeps it in place so um, a lot of people use like a foam um, kind of platform system that has depressions cut in the foam. Um, and then the bases are secured into those depressions and set into a transportation um, van. So that's one possible way. Or even set into a milk crate and secured with uh, paper stuffing so that it doesn't um, get jostled is another possibility. But yeah, I've, I've been attracted to these very, very delicate um, lacy materials. So these may, you know, get damaged in transport. Another possibility is to add the final um, flourishes the final, you know, delicate vine materials, for instance, on site and arrange the piece as far as you can, you know, take it maybe to 75% and then add the more delicate things on site. But I do like a vase like this that's deep enough to hold water reliably um, because it won't slosh so much during transportation, more delicate vases, um, more shallow vases rather, will kind of drop water as they're moved around. I can't tell. Did I make something nice? I can't tell. <laughs> so I think, I think we have a little problem area right here. I would like something there and I would like something right here. It's kind of nice having a screen to see. Uh, usually I'm standing in front of the piece and kind of making sure I, in fact, achieved the shape I was after. That's my first, um, my first area of inquiry. Did I create the shape I intended? Um, second, did I fill it to um, satisfaction? Did I want a very transparent piece? Did I want a more dense piece? 
Um, do I want it to feel really designed? Do I want it to feel really natural? Um, these are questions that I ask myself and then I make edits to ensure that I've achieved the look that I'm intending. Do we have a question? No. Yeah, question. Yeah, so first, uh, Jane Ackerman says, I use the Seminole peg system. Seminole? Seminole system? So, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, which I love. But yes. Even so, I'd worry about the top and uh -huh. sides going from the studio to the vehicle. Mm hmm. Yeah, so I mean, you can certainly make a piece, um, what do they say, in situ, on site. Um, you know, this might be a piece for yourself. This might be a piece for home. This might be something that you design for a restaurant once a week and you do it um, on site. Or, you know, if you don't use such delicate foliages, I think you certainly could make this and deliver. It would just need space. It would need its own space in the van. Yep, question? Uh, yes. Uh Karina Weekman says, I'm wondering how it looks on the inside. Did you place every flower in the flower pin? In the pin, no. Just the first few layers so that they were secure. And then the rest are kind of added into that armature, that natural vine armature that I placed into the vase. Yep, another. Yes, Jane uh, Ackerman says, it's gorgeous. And can you do the same sort of design in the round E-A, E dot A, not three-sided. In a rounded form, sure. Yeah, so in a rounded form, I would just intentionally add each layer in a symmetrical fashion, kind of spinning the piece. On a Lazy Susan is a great way to make a, a rounded form or an oval form that needs to look the same on all sides. Um, so I would just be very deliberate in adding uh, my materials methodically um, and spinning as I go. Mm -hmm. And a question from Berari Hair and Makeup. Yes. When you have your hand-on workshop classes, mm -hmm. do you teach flower arrangements and how do you make wearable flowers too? Yes, yes. Um, so the workshops are always with fresh flowers. Um, typically there's at least three topics that we cover. Often I'll do um, a section on wearable flowers, uh, flowers for the hair, flowers for the body. Um, and then maybe centerpiece work and then large-scale installation is probably the the next most popular topic that I cover. Yep. So we just finished one uh, last yeah. two days. Yep. So maybe another time there will be another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just had a two-day master class at Borma. The first day we made um, headpieces from small, very sellable, um, very uh, wearable, easy to... Um, you know, sell to a bride or to uh, someone going to a prom, um, all the way up to more expressive, more editorial, um, experimental headpieces. And then the second day, we started with floral jewelry um, from little tiny rings all the way up to larger uh, bracelets. We covered body flowers such as epaulettes and necklaces. Um, and then we finished with floral tattoos. So we made so many pieces. <laughs> it was wonderful. Yeah. Question. And then last question, yeah. how long can flowers last in water from Susanna Ferreira? Yeah, well, um, I think every flower has its own lifespan, um, but I've chosen pretty long lasting materials in terms of the flowers. The nearing and the clematis, I think they might have a seven day or even longer base life, seven to 10 days likely. Um, the nearing, uh, it's just an incredible flower. It's so long lasting, but you can see all these little buds. They may mature as well and, and bloom. The Cocosmia is already pretty much dried, so that um, won't change. It'll look um, just as beautiful uh, years to come. The roses are very fresh. You can see they're kind of tight at the moment, but they'll open over the next week. The Clematis, yeah, is also like the Nearing. Um, the thing that's most fleeting, I think, is probably the asparagus because it is 
kind of at the end of its life cycle um, inside in the warmth of um, you know an indoor setting it probably has I don't know a few days before it starts to shed and then the ginkgo I think would probably dry but start to kind of curl um, over the next several days but overall I think a long-lasting piece yeah yeah so here we have kind of a transparent naturally styled kind of statement piece uh, triangular for me in, in shape with a little bit of extra wings on the side but I think um, a very light very kind of um, fresh take on a fall fall uh, composition I hope you liked it so thank you very much Susan it was yeah. really incredible um, I would like to say for everyone who's watching, uh, please check out Susan McClary on Instagram. Uh, you can find all her information over there. And if you like this video, please hit the like button. Uh, that helps us out a lot. Um, and then subscribe if you would like to see more demonstrations like this. We do a live stream every other week. And if you hit the bell button, click on the bell button, then you will be notified whenever we will go live again. So the next time will be in two weeks with my mother. So again, thank you very much, Susan. <laughs> it was really awesome. And uh, yeah, we'll just do the wave goodbye round now. Thank you. Oh, I, I go. <laughs> <laughs> I went too. <laughs> All right, everyone, have a nice weekend, and thank you very much. See you next time.